My name is Stephanie Russo and I am an archivist with Dublin City Library and Archive. I'm also joined by my colleague Tara Doyle um, and of course Dr Susanna Reardon who is our speaker today. Um, you're very welcome along to the third lecture of our 34th series of the City Hall Lunchtime Lecture Series. And those of you who've been along to our previous lectures will know that this is our first um, series to be online. Um, which is which is great. And as I said, we've had a really great reach because of that. So it's 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 worked quite well. Um, before we begin, I just want to let you know that we do have one more lecture scheduled in this series. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Simon Egan, who will be talking to us about the Black Death. So that will be the final talk in this series. Um, and our, pre our first talk by Ida Milne, which sold out, is now available on our library blog. So anyone who missed that, who wants to see it, can take a look at it on there. Um, and Dr. Reardon has kindly agreed for this talk to be recorded too. So if you, if you drop off, your connection goes, or you don't get to hear all of the talk, you will be able to catch that on our library blog as well. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end of the lecture. So if people would put their questions in the Q&A box, that would be great. If we can keep all the questions together, it just makes it a bit easier to find them all and go through them at the end. But you can, of course, use the chat box for, for any other sort of observations or any chat you want to use. Um, someone's asked if I can post a link to the first talk. I will do that. I'll put it in the chat box once Susanna has started speaking. Um, and that's everything. Yes, yeah, so I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Susanna Reardon. Dr. Reardon lectures in modern Irish history in UCD and she has published widely on the politics of sexuality in 20th century Ireland. She is editor along with Catherine Cox of Adolescence in Modern Irish History and along with Dermot Ferreter of Years of Turbulence, The Irish Revolution and Its Aftermath. Today, however, she'll be talking to us about venereal disease, or as I said on Twitter earlier, that's sexually transmitted disease to most of us these days. And in her talk entitled Soldiers and Sex Workers, Venereal Disease in Early 20th Century Ireland. So with that, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Reardon. Uh, thanks very much, Stephanie. And I, I won't say it's lovely to see so many people, but it's lovely to be aware that there's so many people who have come out. So thank you for that. Um, Stephanie is, has not only organised this, and it's wonderful to get the invitation, but she also came up with the beautifully alliterative title, Soldiers and Sex Workers. And I was kicking myself afterwards, I didn't make it Soldiers, Sex Workers and Syphilis, because that is essentially what I'll be talking about. And as Stephanie was saying, the language around this has changed a lot. So just a note on terminology, when I'm, I'm going to use the language that was used in the sources I'm looking at, so by venereal disease, I'm talking about syphilis and gonorrhea primarily, and I will be talking about prostitutes, as that again is the language that's used. Um, and I should specify that I'm talking specifically about female prostitutes. Nothing that I have come across at all talks about male sex workers. That might be something that, that you want to, um, want to have a look at afterwards if you have questions and answers. And of course, the lady who was saying that she nursed in Monto will be very familiar with the map that's in the background there, which is of the Monto district in Ireland, in Dublin. Um, regarded for a long time as the largest open brothel system in the British Empire. And by open brothels, what I mean is unregulated. And this is exactly where I want to start with a little bit of 19th century um, context to this, because throughout Victoria in the United Kingdom under Victoria. Um, prostitution was very often seen as the great social evil, but whether it was a necessary evil or something that needed to be stamped out was the cause of very great division. Where states tended to get involved was when it came to military efficiency. And particularly because we, we have this idea that Venereal diseases are, which of course were pretty much uncurable at that time, if, if not treated soon enough, um, were a byproduct of the sex trade. And that when these damaged military efficiency, that they were associated particularly with the relationship between soldiers and prostitutes. And what happened is prostitutes, women, gave the diseases to soldiers, and soldiers later in life regretted it deeply 
when their own family and their own children were born, for example, with congenital syphilis. And in Napoleon's France and throughout his empire, the best way of dealing with this was through the Maison Tolerae, which is that prostitutes had to be registered and in order to be registered and, lightened, and licensed, sorry, uh, they had to submit for medical examination. So you had a system of regulated prostitution. Now in Britain and in Ireland as well, in the United Kingdom, this was seen as very immoral. The state should not sanction prostitution. However, when it was clear, particularly during the Crimean War, that soldiers were indeed suffering from venereal diseases, um, the British government brought in the Contagious Diseases Act. Sorry, I'm going to move myself around a bit there and see that image. Um, the Contagious Diseases Acts were brought in initially in the 1860s, and they would proclaim certain areas, uh, particularly where there was a strong military or naval presence. And in these, women who were suspected of being prostitutes, in other words, who a policeman would swear he saw soliciting, um, could be. Um, basically, I suppose that the, the word is, is forcibly examined and if found to be suffering from a venereal disease, uh, could be incarcerated for up to nine months until they were deemed to be cured. Um, in Ireland, strangely enough, and I've never found a, an adequate reason for this, Dublin was not one of these districts. Cork was, the Curra Camp was, uh, and also Cove, but Dublin was not. But the introduction of the Contagious Diseases Act had a lot of um, a lot of impact on society, on politics, and so forth. First of all, within Britain, there was a very strong antipathy to these acts, and it brought together a, a kind of an unprecedented group of religious figures, people who were um, people who were concerned about the morality of this. That this was effectively making sure that there were clean prostitutes available. It brought in feminist women and their allies. Uh, the argument being this is completely an attack on women and it would never have been passed in a parliament in which women were adequately represented. And it also brought in labor because people did not have to actually be a prostitute. They had to be suspected of being a prostitute. And you see, <coughs> excuse me, uh, within the labor movement, the argument that one of our daughters could easily be coming home from work in the, in the factory and picked up. And this is very, very worrying. So there is a strong campaign against the Contagious Diseases Act. Uh, Josephine Butler there, one of the, the leaders of it. It's less effective in Ireland, though some names that might be familiar to you, uh, early suffragists and their allies, uh, Isabella Todd, Anna Haslam and so forth involved, but not very much, uh, very exciting there, not an awful lot going on. But there are a lot of impacts on this. It gives a, uh, it gives a boost to suffragist arguments that women ought to have the vote. Uh, it changes the narrative around prostitution. And this is something Butler is very much involved in. She writes an awful lot of morality stories, <coughs> excuse me, in which the woman working in prostitution is not uh, an evil seductress. What she is is probably a domestic servant who's been seduced and betrayed by her employer, uh, who finds herself pregnant, who's cast out of everywhere, who needs to work as a sex worker in order to, to make a living for herself. And one of the consequences of this campaign was the introduction of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885, which is sort of off topic, but I think worth mentioning. It was a piece of legislation which raised the age of consent from 13 to 16, the idea being to protect young women. It also, that act you might be familiar with because it included what was known as La Boucher's Amendment, which was uh, the, the piece of legislation that effectively criminalized homosexuality and the legislation under which Oscar Wilde was prosecuted. But from the point of view of venereal diseases, one of the issues with the campaign against the Contagious Diseases Acts was it was so contentious and opinions were so divided on this that it became virtually impossible to talk about venereal disease in public for a long time because any suggestion that we might go back to the Contagious Diseases Acts is unacceptable and can't be uh, can't be debated. So what happens to change that is revolutionary uh, developments in medical science at the beginning of the 20th century. 
um, sometimes referred to as the German syphilitic trinity. Uh, in 1905, the responsible spirochete for syphilis was discovered. In 1906, the fairly reliable Wasserman test to detect its presence in the human body was discovered. And in 1910, this gentleman here on my left, Paul Ehrlich, uh, discovered or produced, I should say, Salversan, which was a specific remedy for syphilis. Um, Ehrlich was the man who invented the phrase the magic bullet in medicine, the idea of using something deeply harmful that could be deeply harmful to the body to destroy um, the spiral sheet. And uh, the, how this was used, Salverson is an arsenical preparation and the most up-to-date form um, after Salverson became available of treatment for syphilis was um, a combination of intramuscular injections with salverson or its substitutes and also with mercury. So mercury is still being used to treat uh, with pretty much the same effect. Uh, just to mention the fact that gonorrhea was mostly treated by irrigation in the period I'm looking at. And the treatment was deeply humiliating and painful uh, for the sufferer and regarded as uh, pretty much uh, disgusting debasing and not something I want to do by an awful lot of medical professionals, unless, uh, <clears throat> unless they, they were keen on doing that, and very, very few were. Um, by the 1930s, gonorrhea could be treated by tablets, so it becomes less of a problem, but it is not a pleasant set of circumstances. But more to the point, when Ehrlich produced Salverson in 1909, it made it possible for the government, the British government, to accede to long-standing request that it would investigate the question of venereal disease. Because now you had a cure, it was very difficult to make the argument the wages of sin is death. You can protect the innocent by curing the guilty. And a Royal Commission was set up in 1913, which produced a lengthy report, which included Irish witnesses, including um, George Pugin Meldon, senior surgeon at the Westmoreland Lock Hospital. The Westmoreland Lock Hospital, many of you might be familiar with it, it treated women with venereal diseases, and I'll come back to it a little bit later. But Pugin Meldon, who unfortunately I cannot find an online image of, a uh, very, very interesting man. Uh, he was one of those who gave evidence to the Royal Commission about Ireland, and he also represented all of the medical schools uh, in giving evidence. And his evidence gives a very interesting insight, but a very complicated one that can be very difficult to interpret. It was difficult to interpret then, and it's difficult to interpret now. Because to cut a very, cut a very long story short, it turned out that venereal diseases were almost non-existent in parts of Ireland, in Connacht particularly. Uh, it gave rise to a lot of speculation. Was this because people were very moral? Was it because they were all emigrating so there weren't any young people to spread diseases? Was it possible that the diseases in Ireland were less virulent than elsewhere? Um, it was very possibly true that the numbers were unreliable. The Registrar General, who also gave evidence, said, look, doctors will not put, will not certify a death as being as a result of the outcome of venereal disease because either they don't want to distress the family or they don't want the family and all their neighbours to stop attending them uh, because it's, it's the, you know, the stigma is considerable. Belfast uh, and their, their calculation rates based on deaths from complications, particularly of syphilis, Belfast was about the same as any British city. Dublin was out of control. Uh, the figures for Dublin, I'm not going to give you all the, the bits and pieces of deaths per thousand and so, deaths per million and so forth. Uh, but to cut a long story short, 50% of all cases in Ireland seem to be in either Dublin or Belfast. As I say, Belfast, pretty similar to other United Kingdom cities. Uh, Dublin, extraordinarily large. It couldn't be accounted for by the fact that Dublin was a port city and a military um, centre because so was London and yet <clears throat> excuse me the rate of death from syphilis in Dublin was twice or three times higher than in London. So again this became an argument a discussion around prostitutes and soldiers because from an Irish nationalist point of view and the example here I'm giving is Dr Kathleen Lynn a citizen army medical officer during the 1916 rising and founder 
of St. Dalton's Hospital there on the right. And she was very strongly of the opinion that venereal diseases and particularly syphilis were being brought to Dublin by military occupation. And her motives in setting up St. Dalton's, a pediatric hospital uh, solely staffed by women, were primarily to begin with to deal with congenital syphilis, though later she became more broadly interested in pediatrics and of course uh, was very involved in tuberculosis uh, diagnosis and treatment at a later date. But for National Psych Kathleen Lynn, the idea that Dublin was rampant with venereal diseases because of military presence was probably wrong. Uh, I've no answer in case any of you are asking questions as to why the rates in Dublin were so high. Uh, Pugin Meldon was convinced it was because the brothels had been had, had basically been, been dissipated. There was an attempt in the 1890s to close down the brothel areas by vigilance committees and, and by the Dublin Metropolitan Police. Uh, the same thing, of course, happened in 1924 when the Legion of Mary became involved in trying to close down Monta. And Peter Meldon's belief was that what happens there is that up to a point, women who are professional prostitutes are knowledgeable medically and pass on advice to each other and make sure they're taken care of or are bullied into taken care of by the, um, medically by their pimps. But either way, he suggested what had happened in Dublin was that now most prostitution was part time and that um, women didn't have the, the information that they needed, but also were afraid of the stigma of going to the lock hospital. So the other side of that was the military was actually very good at diagnosing and treating um, venereal diseases, with the exception possibly of the Lock Hospital itself. Now, again, unfortunately, I can't find the original photograph of that, but that is the Westmoreland Lock Hospital, uh, originally founded in 1755. In 1820, it closed its doors to men. It solely treated women and was particularly associated with the treatment of prostitutes. Funny, fun, um, excuse me functioning in part like a Magdalene Asylum with a strong emphasis on moral reformation. However, by the early 20th century, it had significant advantages over other hospitals. Um, the Westmoreland Lock Hospital was state funded. Um, venereal specialists, uh, Pugin Meldon himself later on, and also per Percy Kirkpatrick worked there. Uh, patients were treated free. They were treated with the most up-to-date medicine or with the most up-to-date methods, including with Salverson. Um, up to the discovery of Salverson, there was no outpatients department and that was part of the, the carceral element of it. When Salverson became available, uh, they opened an outpatients department. However, they felt, and this was the case very much with, with anybody with syphilis and gonorrhea, that as soon as the symptoms clear up, they will wander off. They won't want to continue treatment. It's unpleasant, it's stigmatized, etc. So the Westmoreland Lock Hospital offered women jobs as laundry uh, in their laundry or as ward maids. And the crucial difference between this and Magdalene Asylum is that was an offer, it wasn't compelled, and it was paid. And so women had the choice if they wanted to stay on, uh, if they were prepared to work for the hospital and so forth. So that was the treatment available for women and it was as up to date as it possibly could be. Um, for men, uh, Dr. Stevens Hospital opened a venereal ward for men with six beds, which were usually full back in 1820 when the Westmoreland stopped accepting uh, male patients. But most voluntary hospitals, and there's a bit of uncertainty around this, but it seems that most voluntary hospitals were unwilling to take venereal patients. And the reason given to the Royal Commission was that um, their subscribers didn't like it. And there's some suggestion that, and I've been through the, the census looking for, in 1911, looking for, um, for patients, but Pugin Meldon is certainly suggesting that patients may have been registered under a different complaint so that Salverson could be used, or they may have had to pay for their treatment uh, if they were, uh, because the subscribers wouldn't like it otherwise. But generally speaking, Stevens is the only hospital in addition to the Westmoreland Hospital. And that of course means that there isn't um, medical training available to um, in venereal diseases, which becomes increasingly problematic as time goes on. 
uh, Salverson required a lot of skill and training to administer, although it increasingly became um, easier to do so. Um, the two Dublin workhouse infirmaries did accept male venereal disease patients, but they did not have access to means of getting proper diagnoses. Uh, to, to get a Wasserman test, basically, you had to have a good working relationship with the university laboratory. Uh, they were doing it as a matter of a favour, and therefore you had to have the connections. The workhouses didn't do that. And of course, they didn't treat with Salverson, which means it was virtually impossible for a man to get free and up to date treatment. Although anecdotally, and it's only anecdotally, private practitioners were doing a roaring trade with the middle classes. But the Royal Commission's report led to a revolution in the state's engagement with venereal diseases. Uh, throughout the rest, throughout Great Britain, when it published in 1916, within five months, our uh, procedures had been set in place to follow its recommendations by setting up a national free, local and anonymous system of clinics for venereal diseases. Uh, the state paid 75%, local government paid 25%. And this was applied to Ireland, but it was delayed for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, legislative holdups. Uh, secondly, by the fact that county infirmaries throughout the country simply did not want a venereal disease clinic. And thirdly, by the fact that in September 1920, the Dole called on local government to make a clean break with the local government board and to recognise the Dole's Department of Local Government in its stead. Uh, at the time that happened, only these counties, um, that is Louth, Kildare, Monaghan, Westmeath and Wicklow had set up schemes uh, in 1919. And with the exception of Monaghan, uh, which is obviously much further from Dublin, and set up a local clinic in Clonus Workhouse, the rest of them entered into negotiations with the two venereal centres, uh, not the Lock Hospital, Dr. Stevens, and also uh, Sir Patrick Duns. Um, in the interest of better research, I, of course, got married in St. Patrick Duns uh, just a few years ago. But nonetheless, it became the hospital for Dublin County, uh, with Dr. Stevens being the uh, Dublin City, and all of the uh, counties that had set up schemes negotiated to send their patients there, as I say, with the exception of Monaghan. Now, a second difference, so we don't have local clinics, we have Dublin clinics. The second difference is there is no publicity whatsoever. And this was absolutely a crucially part of the British scheme, which was that, for example, this is the, the Salford scheme. Um, certainly talking about uh, the best way to avoid syphilis is to behave with uh, continence before marriage and faithfulness afterwards. But in the meantime, this is what you need to know. You need to get treated early and here's where you can get, go and do it. There was absolutely no publicity for the Irish scheme at all. And that was a very, very um, deliberate decision and would remain so throughout the 20th century. Uh, there is there was a debate in the Dáil over what would happen to the hugely expensive public health services that the Dáil was now responsible for. There was a suggestion that they be cut, and this was particularly maternity and child and venereal disease services. And the debate in the Dáil, people are absolutely outraged that there would be any cuts in maternal and child welfare benefits. So the decision is taken that all the cuts should fall on venereal disease. Um, in fact, that, that, that has given rise to the idea that the Dole cut venereal disease funding. In fact, it didn't. Um, it did the opposite. It didn't increase it, but it took on the full cost, not just the 75% cost of existing schemes. The amount of money involved was, was fairly minimal. Also, both the Dublin hospitals, both Dr. Stevens and Sir Patrick Duns, essentially pulled a fast one once the Dole was paying for everything. Uh, in Dr. Stevens, they put up their charges, they put up salaries, and in Sir Patrick Dunn's, they come up with the wonderful wheeze of designating all resident junior doctors as venereal disease nurses, so they could pick up the salary from the doll. So that's what they were doing for the fight for independence. But when, by the time the, um, by the time of independence, and of moving back to a regularly functioning venereal disease system. Uh, the government is pretty happy that it's working very well, but 
the army is not happy at all. Uh, the army begins to note during the Civil War, well, as early as August 1922, there is an extraordinary rise in incidence of new cases. And they particularly noticed this in the second quarter of 1923, following the Republican arms dump of May. And at first, the army made the traditional uh, view that it's about prostitutes and soldiers, that what we need to do is, is get the military and civilian police to harass. Uh, prostitutes to punish men who contracted venereal disease. But pretty quickly, the director of the medical services, Army Medical Service, Major General Francis Moran, began to take a very serious approach to this. He suggested that the disease, and I quote, the disease is assuming alarming proportions. I consider the matter is becoming a menace to the efficiency of the army and a danger to the public health. And he starts campaigning on all fronts. Uh, he writes to the chaplains, for example, saying, you've got to take this seriously. There is now a saying in the army that a man is not blooded until he has contracted a venereal disease. Uh, the, the statistics or the, the images that I'm showing you there, sorry, the quality isn't great. This is pre-digitization photocopying, but the map hand drawn um, with a very strange border area is coming from, from the military and showing where men contracted diseases, which suggests that this is not just a Dublin problem. Also, um, as the case on the right suggests, the cases attributable to prostitutes were in fact comparatively very few. And in fact, these might be overstated because Moran noted, uh, a woman was noted to have been a prostitute if the man gave her any gift, including, he says, a bottle of beer. The army though, and you will see, sorry, I'm just going to move this slightly so you can see this. What's happening on the right there where the figures go down is they introduce prophylaxis in 1925. Now I want to be very clear that I'm talking about prophylaxis, not prophylactics. I have read that um, the Irish army was using condoms uh, and that de Valera stopped it. This is not the case. They were using disinfectant. And this was very well known. Uh, it had been known in the British Army for a very long time. And many of the army medical professionals, the Irish army medical professionals uh, had learned that there. What the army were recommending was a system of civilian prophylaxis. The people who had been exposed to a venereal disease could disinfect themselves and prevent themselves from getting syphilis. Uh, this went to government, or rather originally to a, to a three-man um, uh, interdepartmental committee, and they would not recommend civilian prophylaxis. Uh, they offered no explanation of this deliberate omission, except the present state of public opinion. They get very much involved in discussions about should venereal diseases become notifiable? Should there be what we now call a track and trace system? But no debate on this occurred whatsoever for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, the Minister for Local Government and Public Health, James Burke, announced that he didn't want the report of the committee published. Uh, there's some division in cabinet about it. They do what the Common Gael cabinet tends to do, which is to ask the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Dublin for his opinion. And Edward Byrne says, do not publish it. But also the Department of Local Government and Public Health did not want to do anything terrifically new. Or they, they suggest that these figures that I'm, these, <clears throat> excuse me, illustrations and the figures suggest that they talk about military matters. They have nothing to do with the civilian population. We don't know about it at all. The department's view is leave us alone, let us do our own good. But they actually, they might have been very, very right because local councils, as I said, do not want to set up a venereal disease scheme. And the way in which the department acts is it waits until it is billed for a patient who has been treated for a venereal disease and then says, you know, you could have got this an awful lot cheaper if you had a venereal disease scheme. Uh, you also see one of the, the best times to set up a venereal disease scheme is when the local authority has actually been suspended, though some county medical officers of health were extremely proactive. And there's one, although I want to kind of concentrate on Dublin, there is a, um, an account given by a Clare, the Clare uh, County Medical Officer of Health, GP McCarthy, in 1938. He was, it was suggested to him that he needed a local clinic. He was keen to push for Dublin. A lot of them, them were. Patients don't want to be treated locally. Uh, local 
local people don't want them to be treated locally either. But also because of the stigma attached to the disease, they will not be treated if they are treated locally. But it was suggested to McCarthy that the tuberculosis, the tuberculosis dispensary in Ennis would be an excellent place to also set up a VD clinic. And he responds by saying, we can't do that. In this small building, tuberculosis clinics are held two days a week, ophthalmic, ophthalmic clinics on another two, a further two devoted to dental clinics once we have a dentist. As it is, the waiting room was converted into a dark room and in consequence, and I quote, the patients and attendants sit or stand in the corridor or out in the grounds. And on very wet days, the overflow is accommodated in the single room, which comprises my office premises. Furthermore, there was only one outdoor toilet for the use of all patients and office and medical staff. And he said, at the risk of consi being considered particular, I venture to suggest that it is scarcely proper that patients suffering from venereal diseases should now be added to the clientele to avail of this accommodation. <laughs> but as you can see from the map, by 1939, the department is making considerable headway. And then it decides in 1939 to stop instituting venereal disease schemes because in the current state of affairs, we really can't afford them. Or to put it another way, uh, very strangely, the Irish government decides on the brink of an international war, a world war, a time when venereal diseases tend to escalate that we can't afford to improve our venereal disease uh, treatment. And the figures began to rise again. Now, just to give you an overview, these are um, not the total number of cases. <coughs> Excuse me, the only, um, the only cases that, the only numbers that are available for this period are the cases treated in the Dublin treatment centers. So it doesn't include private patients, but nonetheless, if it's unreliable, it's reasonably uh, unreliable. You might be wondering what these two lines are. Uh, 1935 is the year in which condoms become illegal and yet the figures go down. So we have gone forward accidentally there, the figures go down and then come the war period, they start to go right up again. Um, by 1944, there was something of a venereal disease panic in Ireland. The matters began to be uh, discussed very, very broadly. Um, in public, in, in 1944, the Gate Theatre put on the play Damaged Goods. Now, whether this is, is cause and effect, I don't know, but everybody is talking throughout the country about venereal disease and the problem with it. And you get an awful lot of, of what can only be considered mythology as well. Um, there is a an anonymous letter to the Department of Health from April 1944, naming a worker in Drumlish Creamery in County Louth, who was, and I quote, all swarmed with clap or that dirty disease that is contracted by bad living. And in July of that year, a lady from Upper Mount Street in Dublin wrote to complain of what she called an improper flat in her building, to which bad cases of what she called beautifully vernal disease were being admitted. And I've always suspected that because um, cases of scabies were rising as well, that maybe people were getting confused by what they had seen. But there were also medical professionals beginning to, to come out and to talk about venereal disease, and they were, had been previously very reluctant to do that. The problem was identified in Dr. Stevens Hospital and published was that women tended not to seek out treatment, that this increase in figures was accounted for almost completely by men, that male defaulting was extremely high, being about 50% for syphilis and 75% for gonorrhea, that is people who don't continue treatment, and that the problem is lack of information. And it was warned that when thousands of infected soldiers and workers returned to Ireland after the war, there would be a serious problem. Um, one of the people that involved themselves in this was actually the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, John Charles McQuaid, who was actually the, his sister was a venereologist. And he started trying to encourage the Catholic voluntary hospitals to treat venereal disease patients, making a contribution of, of 3,000 pounds, a lot of money in those days, to Jervis Street for the training of a doctor, the establishment of a venereal clinic, um, and so forth. So there's a lot more discussion around 1944 about venereal disease than there had been previously. Many people saying that what we need is a, a publicity campaign. The view of the Department of Local Government and Public Health is basically this is all nonsense, there's no problem, there's no cause for concern, and there is no need for what are called extravagant 
publicity. There is a lot of discussion around it um, within the department, and I won't go into all the details of that, because what happens then is that everything, all the ideas are all the discussions, all the questions about do we need a publicity campaign? No, absolutely we don't. And by the way, as an aside, the argument for why we don't have a publicity campaign is the Catholic Church wouldn't like it. But I've never found uh, any documentation that suggests that there was any consultation. But this uh, three man, uh, not quite team, change of government, but Con Ward, the parliamentary secretary, our junior minister at the Department of Local Government and Public Health, uh, his Fianna Fáil colleague, Jim Ryan, who became Minister for Health, and then Noel Brown. Uh, three characters who are perhaps best known for the problems related to the mother and child scheme. And this was part of the, the how do we deal with, with syphilis and gonorrhea, how do we deal with venereal diseases, are part of the same package. Um, Conward was particularly interested in treating, of course, mother and child welfare, maternal and child welfare, but also with treating infectious diseases. And he insisted, rather incorrectly, in regarding venereal diseases as infectious. So what happens is his provisions are in his failed 1945 Act, which becomes Ryan's successful 1947 Act, which includes the mother and child scheme. And to cut a very long story short, um, Conward liked locking people up. Uh, from the 1920s, he had been making speeches in the Dáil in which he said that venereal diseases could easily be spread to innocent people through um, toilet seats and towels and so forth. Now, whether he was doing that to be politic, uh, to say, you know, you, you could have contracted it innocently, so do come forward, I, I, I don't know, or whether he genuinely believed it. But his, his plan is that he, he doesn't like the venereal disease system, the scheme. He believes that, and, and states very openly, that if people are treated privately, it's no business of the state, and people who can't afford to be treated privately won't get treated at all, and therefore uh, they should be locked up until they are uh, proven to be uh, uninfectious. Um, Ryan did not suggest that this was about innocence, but he did, and, and there's really, there's a campaign to persuade people that obliging people to receive treatment is not a breach of their civil liberties. Uh, and the argument that they both make, and Ryan makes it most particularly, is, and I quote, one of the first and most important conditions which these provisions are intended to counter is the spread of venereal disease contracted from prostitutes soliciting in the streets. So in other words, we're not going to um, bring in everybody who is, uh, we're not going to oblige everyone who has an infectious disease to submit for treatment, it will only apply to prostitutes. And the arguments then go out the window. Okay, that's that's fair enough. Uh, and that included John Charles McQuaid, who was very troubled by this. Uh, and who, in fact, he, he was in a sort of an uncharacteristic position of theological uncertainty and took spiritual advice, uh, which persuaded him that prostitutes and their children did not have the same rights as other people. So the idea, and it was based on an Emergency Powers Act, which allowed, um, which had come in during the war, and which allowed anyone who was described as, and I quote, a probable source of infection to be um, isolated until cured. The problem is, it's nonsense when, with regard to venereal diseases. How do you define somebody as being a probable source of infection without getting into the question of their likely sexual behavior? So that becomes extremely problematic. Um, to sum up on, on this particular issue, by 1951, the Department of Local Government and Public Health was again addressing the question of what are we going to do with venereal disease? Uh, one character who's involved there is Paddy Fanning. And I'm just mentioning him because he was the father of my late colleague, the historian and columnist, Ronan Fanning. And of course, when I saw um, Paddy Fanning's name turning up all over the files, and he later became a governor of the Westmoreland Lock Hospital, I was asking Ronan, tell me what he, he told you about that. Ronan had never known his father was a governor of the Westmoreland Lock Hospital. We just didn't talk about venereal disease at home. But while they are they're working on how can we improve the scheme, <clears throat> they run into all kinds of difficulties. And this is uh, a colleague of Fanning's um, named O'Sullivan where he's saying there would be, it would be impossible to bring in a comprehensive plan for ensuring track and trace basically, accurate statistics and treatment in all cases. And he discusses at great length what 
the opposition, both reasonable and unreasonable, might be. Um, we'd have to test by subterfuge. The tests aren't particularly reliable. The disease isn't infectious at all stages. Infectious cases are not necessarily a public danger. Liberty of the individual, interference with the medical professional, embarrassment, breach of confidence, undue interference in what is reputed to be a lucrative portion of private practice in the case of medical practitioners who treat this disease and running out of steam, morality, bureaucracy, etc. So they never did produce a, ultra, uh, a reliable venereal disease scheme and they didn't have to because in 1944 penicillin had begun to become available. Now this um, this chart will look particularly odd. What's happening with the leap um, in 1945-1946 is they began to get statistics again very unreliable but that's assumed they were consistently unreliable statistics from private practitioners. So the figure seems to leap up but in fact probably doesn't but you can see the rapid decline back into 1951. And by 1951, it also began possible to ensure that um, patients could be treated in regular hospitals. Although I know in my own lifetime, the special ward in the Matter Hospital was known as the special ward. So things are beginning to normalize. We can treat venereal disease patients pretty much as we treat other people, other patients. We don't need a scheme. And one of the, the casualties of the changing times was the Westmoreland Lock Hospital. For all Ward's desire to lock people up, he wasn't without charity. And in 1945, he reconstituted the Board of Governors of the hospital and charged them with developing it so it become the principal hospital for venereal diseases in women and asking them to involve themselves in case finding and contract tracing, indeed, uh, track and trace again. He also suggested they rename the hospital and suggested they might find, as he put it, some suitably broad-minded saint, uh, which they did. Uh, they renamed the hospital, the Hospital of St. Margaret of Cortona. Sorry, I'm moving myself all over the place here. Um, a fallen woman, uh, without going into her entire history, but rather a sympathetic one who's, who's shown here with her son, uh, the child of a Tuscan nobleman in the 14th. Eleni Quillanon's poem, on St. Margaret of Cortona, patroness of the Lock Hospital, is suggesting that essentially people were being stigmatized again, being regarded as, as whores in that hospital. But I would point out that the new governors were forward looking and enthusiastic, and they did quite a lot of interesting things, but they discovered that Ward did not match his desires for what they should do with the money to do it. And the hospital, which was already falling apart, um, became actually dangerous. It was evacuated in 1945, in 1949, uh, continued for some time to provide an outpatient service, but was demolished in 1955. And the editor, the Irish Times in an editorial noted the passing of the old Lock Hospital, which it said would hardly be regretted by anyone. It is an interesting history, but stood as an unwanted reminder of a less happy chapter in Dublin's past. And the site witnessed Dublin's movement from its past to a rather self-conscious modernity. Um, the site was owned by Dublin Corporation and it became uh, the home of the city's first luxury PMPA car park. And secondly, by the beloved Markovich swimming pool, uh, the first pool to be built by Dublin Corporation in 64 years, now of course the Markovich Leisure Centre. And I don't know, it, Will I conclude? Will I, will I come up with anything that might talk to us about the present time without being absolutely facile? Um, don't set up track and trace mechanisms unless you put the money behind them. Um, politicians and medical professionals tend to have different priorities. But I suppose that the main thing would be stigma kills and people need information. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. That was a really fascinating lecture. Thank you very much. Um, we do have some questions. I'm sure you'll be I able to answer them. I will, I'll shout a few out for you here. Um, there's lots of uh, complimentary comments coming in as well about what a wonderful talk it was. Um, the first question is, to what extent might the prevalence of STDs in this period explain marital infertility, either by a sterility or abstinence? It, it can do absolutely. That's that's a really good question. 
Um, in terms of sterility, yes, it, it's actually the um, the Westmoreland Lock Hospital in the um, census of 1911 actually gives names. Most hospitals don't. Uh, so it's one of the reasons I, I want wasn't going to look at it but you can see actually from the women in there because the census gives how many uh how many children they have had and how many are still alive so it's the only statistic that i can see but absolutely it would in terms of abstinence i don't know the answer to that because it depends on people knowing they have the problem uh and it can be very very difficult if you don't know what you are you are looking for um people who weren't professionals, either military or uh, prostitutes, may not have identified the problem until it was too late. Absence after that. So I'm sorry, I can't give an answer to that, but it could be. But again, we're getting into the speculation. What if the figures are completely wrong? What if the maps are right? What if this venereal disease throughout Ireland cannot have had the impact that, that your questioner was talking about very possibly? Okay, thank you. Um, another one. Do we know why the women in Dublin were not subject to random examinations, but the women in Cork and the Curra, etc. were? I don't know, and I've been trying to look into it recently because I've never found an answer for that. Maria Luddy is the best historian of 19th century prostitution, and she doesn't particularly look into it. I suspect, but again, I'm guessing here, that it was because Dublin was seen as civilian rather than military. That would you, it was um, the Contagious Diseases Act applied in, in military basis. There was a campaign to extend them to civilian populations, and that again, very, very contentious. So I'm assuming that um, the Curra, for example, is definitely a military camp. We need it there. Cove, military or uh, naval base, we need it there. Um, I'm not aware of any great campaign to extend it. Uh, the debate is, is very muted. Uh, in Ireland, nobody wants to get involved in it, whereas it's very heated about extension of the Contagious Diseases Act. It also is worth pointing out that Dublin already had a lock hospital, whereas they were built for um, for these women um, in Cork and somewhere else as well that's escaped me. It might have been the curve, but I might be putting you wrong. So it may well have been. It, it also seems, one of the things Pugin Meldon says when he's giving evidence to the Royal Commission is that the number of patients in the lock hospital in Dublin went up during the Contagious Diseases Acts. And it might have been an, in anticipation of them spreading and people are taking care of their health. So again, a, a very imprecise answer. Unfortunately, it's a very imprecise subject, but it, it may well be that, that Dublin was regarded as already well catered for in that regard. Okay, here's one a little bit in jest, but can Susanna give any guidance as to how to get the image of the treatment instruments she put up on the screen <laughs> and left up for an inordinate length of time out of my head? Brilliant I am job. very sorry. Be very, very grateful. I did not show you speculums such as were used under the Contagious Diseases Act and be really glad I didn't show you anything from the Wellcome Trust's beautiful array of images of people with syphilis and gonorrhea. <laughs> I was being kind, but thank you for the question. Someone actually did put up on our Twitter feed earlier, they were wondering if they should have their lunch before or during the talk because they were saying that when they were looking at a similar topic in university, they, they saw some very foul images. So I'm aware that you did spare us probably. <laughs> I decided it was probably best not yeah. without a trigger. <laughs> okay, well, we have some more serious questions here as well that we'll go back to. Um, was there a different approach from the British Army in the 1910s and from the Irish Army in the 1920s, or was it predominantly a militaristic approach from both? Um, it's, it's an interesting one, and it is. There's actually divisions in the Irish Army in the 1920s. Uh, the British Army in the 1910s, well, if, if we go into the First World War period, a bit before that, I'm a bit dodgy on, so I'm not certain about. They knew about prophylaxis. They were using prophylaxis. They were doing it quietly. Uh, officers and officers would tell their men, by the way, if you must do what we're telling you not to do, this is what you need to do about it. The 1920s, the Irish Army in the 1920s is absolutely fascinating because... Um, the medical corps, the legal corps, a lot of those that's in British Army service, whereas a lot of the, the general officer corps, and I'm going to get my medical terminology wrong here, so forgive me, um, were not. And there's actually a debate in the army as to whether we should use prophylaxis or not. Um, a division between those who say it is dangerous to talk to men about prophylaxis. There's also, um, they use the, an automatic discharge rule which again is used in wartime as well, unfortunate choice of words, but there you go. 
Um, if a man has contracted a venereal disease, he is effectively, he is punished, he is isolated and he is discharged as soon as possible. And they begin to realize in the 1920s that sending people back into the general public away from medical discipline um, in order to, with a venereal disease is, is perhaps not very, very clever. And there's a lot of change in time between wartime armies and peacetime armies. So is it militaristic? Yes. Is it efficient? Yes, absolutely. There are debates in it. Does it compare? I would say the Irish army of the 1920s is very similar to the Irish army, to the British army of the 1910s, but possibly not to the British army of, of, of the, the 1920s. So again, I'm, I'm speculating wildly, but the, the, <laughs> the, it's coming from the same place. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, another one, where in Dublin was the Lock Hospital and what was the origin of the name Lock? Uh, Townsend Street and uh, where, the, where the swimming pool is now. It was originally actually in Donnybrook. They, they swapped premises between the Royal Hospital uh, in Donnybrook and, and, in, and the one in Townsend Street when it was um, for the incurables originally. The origin of the word Lock is Lock, Locked Up, Lock Ward. Um, strong emphasis on segregation for a lot of reasons all the way through um some concern about infection spreading but a lot of concern about you don't want to mix people with venereal diseases with other patients and this changes the emphasis on that changes a lot of times sometimes it's um because they're embarrassed you know there's a kind of a compassionate they do not want other people to know they're here um but sometimes it's, it's the other way around and particularly with women in the sex trade you did not want them in your hospital. But what I find interesting is that the argument that's made by medical professionals about that is the problem is that these women, particularly the longer they've been in the sex trade, they drink a lot, they curse a lot, they're a problem to have in a hospital as opposed to they are immoral people, which I find quite interesting, com comparatively speaking. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, now, this might have been a typo that a couple of people have picked up on, or, or it might be otherwise explained, but a couple of people have said that they noticed that Ryan and Brown were ministers for health contemporaneously. I don't know if that was just a... That could be a typo, and I should be, be looking typo. back on it. No, they are not contemporaneously, and there may be a typo on that. Okay. They're sending <laughs> no, me I back <laughs> to... For, I, yes, I Ryan Minister for Health, 48 to 51. It was a typo. I um, I do apologise. Thank you. It's great <laughs> that people are paying that much attention. <laughs> yes, I know. I was amazed. I didn't notice that. Um, were venereal diseases widespread in the community as well as in the military? We don't know. The, the, the only figures we have are coming from the Registrar General's office, and that is deaths from complications. Uh, the Reg in fact, in 1911, the Registrar General's office started to query medical certificates. Uh, if he thought it was something like aneurysm, which could be syphilis and, and, and maybe isn't. Um, the figures that, that, that emerge from the, uh, the Royal Commission in 1913 are there are virtually there's virtually no uh, venereal diseases in Connacht. There's very little in the rest of the country and they don't know why that's the case. Is it because of, of poor registration? The military figures are looking at where where soldiers um, where soldiers became infected. And if that geography is, is revealing of a civilian population rather than a professionally prostituted population, it would suggest they were widespread. Now, certainly when, um, when Dr. Stevens started set up its, uh, when it opened its clinic uh, in 1919, opened out its clinic, accepting more patients, they were absolutely overwhelmed. That, that not only, even without the, um, even without the um, publicity, people were coming to the hospital, people wanted treatment. You also see there's some heartbreaking, um, you know, the voice of the of the patient doesn't come out very much in this at all. It's very hard to, to, to find out what people are thinking themselves who are sufferers, but you will get it occasionally. And some of them are absolutely heartbreaking. For example, in uh, counties that did not have a venereal disease scheme, your doctor could get um, Salversan if he was qualified to administer it free. So that meant if you were in a county that didn't have a venereal disease scheme, you needed to find a doctor who knew what he was doing, who would be prepared to treat you for free. Uh, and as I said, there are some letters in the Department of Health and the Department of Defence as well. Some were coming from soldiers. Please, can you do something for me? And the people that get a return letter, there was one lady, given the address she gives, I think she was probably a domestic servant because she's writing care of 
uh, presumably the um, the householder and saying, please, 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 can you do something with me? I have gonorrhea. And she gets a standard letter back, which is, since there is no venereal disease in your count scheme in your county, your, your general practitioner can be supplied free with Salverson. Now, Salverson is a remedy for syphilis, not for gonorrhea. So, you know, how people manage. Some people found their way up to Dublin themselves uh, are looking for, um, looking for anonymity. And there's a certain amount of, um, patient activism in terms of, in, in Limerick, for example, they refuse to use the, they refuse, the patients refuse to use the pharmacist because they, they didn't want to go to that pharmacist. Everyone would know why they were going to that pharmacist. Some people, patients complained about Stevens Hospital and got moved to Dunn. So they're not completely uh, without the ability to, to take care of themselves, but we know very, very little about them. I'm sorry, I've completely lost track of the question there. Um, that was just, I think, the one about being widespread in the community. Widespread, <laughs> sorry, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't know. The answer to every question is we haven't a clue, but we can guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I'm sure you're giving very um, informed and educated guesses in your answers. Um, OK, another one. Could you please talk a bit more about the reaction to the Gates 1934 play? Always surprised by how progressive the original Gate was. Um, just very, very good. It feeds into, because this debate is taking place about venereal disease anyway, and particularly the Irish Times is championing it. Um, the play was originally, um, was, was first performed in Dublin the Gaiety in 1914, and it's, it's a revival of a wartime slash syphilis, <coughs> excuse me, play. Um, I don't know whether it was adults only as the 1914 production was. It's something I want to look into in a bit more detail. But the reviews that I've seen are just good performance, important topic. Um, so again, sorry, I, I can't give anything more on that. But it was interesting that the gate showed it. Here's another interesting question. Was Dublin regarded as the place for soldiers from all over the empire to spend their leave specifically because of its notoriety as a red light district? And would this account for the high percentage of VD? That is interesting. I've never considered it and I've no idea. <laughs> I, I, I know that one of the princes of Wales and which one it was has gone out of my head is supposed to have lost his virginity in Monta. So there may oh, wow. be a, tourist, a tourism <laughs> element to it. Um, um, but no, I'm, I must look into that. Thank you. Yeah, an interesting question. Uh, OK, are there any accessible records of individuals in the 1910s and 20s, apart from prison records and newspaper archives, which can be got online? Um, records of, of, of which? What is what's your question? Um, they just say individuals. I wonder, would these be potential patients, maybe? The... I'm, I'm thinking um, Percy Kirkpatrick kept a case book. And that is, is available in the Royal College, but online, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, so I think the answer is, is, is probably no there. Um, the Westmoreland Lock Hospital records went up in flames. Uh, they were deliberately burnt, although a passing physician, who this passing physician was, I have no idea. The story goes, a passing physician uh, rescued them, but they're mostly from um, the 19th century, the ones that survive. So I was putting together what was happening in the Westmoreland Hospital from government files. So I think these days the answer is probably no. And to make it even worse, uh, these being matters surrounded by discretion, uh, they're not much discussed in the newspapers anyway, although more so in the 20s than later. Okay, and this sort of ties in a bit to that answer, I think. Um, a child born in the Rotunda Hospital in June 1920 and then died in the Lock Hospital seven weeks later. Would the mother have been moved with the baby to the lock hospital? And when the child died, where would she have been buried? And what was um, the mother's chance of surviving? And then she says that she, she understands that the records um, for the lock were destroyed. Yeah, I, I don't know, but my view on, on the lock when there are babies there is that the babies are there with their mothers. They're not being treated. That doesn't okay. mean that they don't have congenital syphilis. Um, in 20, I wonder could it have been St. Ulton's? Um, so where would the baby, I'm sorry, I, I have absolutely no idea. Um, but if you, if, if you would like to email me, I will see if there is somebody who knows, but I suspect I, I won't be able to, to help you much. I'm very sorry about that. But it was, um, it was owned by the state. Where were people, I'm sorry, I've never looked into it, so I don't know. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. You can't know everything. Um, we are just out of time. I wonder if I can just pick one more. 
Okay, well, this is interesting because it ties in a bit to last week's talk. Is there any correlation between those who were diagnosed with VD and those who ended up in places like Port Ran for insanity? Um, in there's an issue here as well, isn't there always? Um, one of the problems with the statistics is that a lot of the areas of the countryside that seem to have a very low VD rate don't have asylums either. So the people that are coming in with general paralysis, the insane, for example, and being treated in asylums are being noted. But yes, there is, um, there, there very possibly is because it is one of the, the later stages. Uh, and there certainly are, again, I have, um, I have found people with general paralysis the insane in regular hospitals, but it is very likely they would be in psychiatric hospitals as well. Okay, well, I'm afraid we didn't get to all of the questions and there are lots and lots of comments coming in thanking you, Susanna, and saying what an interesting lecture it was. And um, so I would like to echo those thanks. Um, as I said, this has been recorded. So if, if anyone wants to come back and listen again, um, it'll probably be up by next week anyway, if people want to listen back. Um, so yes, thank you very much, Dr. Reardon. Um, and thank you all for coming along. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of you at next week's lecture. And thank you, Stephanie, and thanks everybody. And for the great questions. <laughs> Indeed. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.